Ladies and gentlemen, another scintillating episode of Crave TV. This is the wine czar, Kenny K, coming at you. I'd like to introduce my co hosts and good friends. Let's start with Joe, the hanger steak anger, my man in Utah. Hey, there he is. How's it going? Hey, y'all. How's, how's your night? Next, next is the most dangerous guest on the show. She's the tornado from Plano, my girl, <laughs> Lisa Delano. Hi, guys. Hi, Lisa. No mask necessary. <laughs> All right. This, this is just to keep men away from me. That's not six feet. <laughs> All right. That's for another topic. And last but not least, the man who started Crave. The king of all restaurants, the number one nicest restaurant reviewer on the planet, Stephen, the man Doyle. Steve, hey, guys. Up. So good to see you, Kenny. Yeah. Hey, girls, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. Here, man. So we got quite a show tonight here, y'all. Uh, we're going to start off with Stephen busting out a bit of some, uh, you know, upbeat, not, uh, not too down and depressing news. That's rare nowadays, so this will be really nice. Uh, Kenny's going to come in pretty heavy and hard, I'm guessing. I, I think you got two uh, Vegas restaurant reviews. Is that right, Kenny? Correct, sir. Correct. Right. I'm excited. And then uh, after that, we're going to have Chef Ryan Carberry on to uh, catch us up with some, uh, you know, Dallas area restaurant happenings and uh, get to know him a little bit, see what he's up to, and uh, kind of learn a bit about his craft. I, I'm looking forward to that. It's going to be awesome. Um, after that, we have a very great, uh, you know, Lisa being a wine expert and all, Kenny Wine Czar, Lisa, second in command Wine Czar. <laughs> Lisa's going to be busting out a uh, pretty awesome wine segment here. Uh, are you doing a review or can, can you give us a little, a little taste of what we can expect, Lisa? Well, being that I'm so late in the segment today, I think I'm just going to get drunk during y'all's part. So, Whoa. Uh, I'm going right. to start like right it. now, actually. Hey, that's sounds, what I like to hear. <laughs> sounds like a Diet plan. Coke. <laughs> Very excited. So, um, just, after, just, just for the record, uh, my first Isla Scotch. Cheers, Lisa. Cheers, Salud. guys. Cheers, y'all. Mm. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, yeah. Um, after that, we've got a really interesting guest, actually. Uh, we call him Sprout. We'll set up his real name in a little bit. But he is a music artist manager out of a place called Space Kernel Management. Sounds like a David Bowie reference to me. Maybe a little Major Tom influence going on there. We'll ask him about that. And uh, that should uh, wrap us up for the show tonight. So that's, uh, that's what we got coming at you. Uh, Steven, what do you have for news? All right. Um, so uh, it's been a strange week uh, amid the COVID. Uh, we all agreed not to discuss COVID as a as a rule, but um, uh, there are some closings of restaurants, which is kind of depressing. Uh, the Foundry or and Chicken Scratch, uh, that's a Chris Zilke restaurant. Um, it's gone under Ross Hall. Uh, 560 uh, closed last week. Uh, Bird Cafe in Fort Worth. Holland Park Cafeteria uh, has been around for over 90 years. Um, shuttered. Uh, Sushi Bajiashi in uh, Trinity Groves, gone. Uh, Lizard Lounge, depressingly gone. Uh, Dakota's was announced uh, uh, our time yesterday, um, if you're watching the show, it was last week, um, <laughs> The Lot, Eastside Social, uh, Jake's on Henderson uh, shuttered, but uh, not due to COVID. Uh, their other operations are doing just fine. There's a landlord dispute there. And uh, that's pretty much it for the closings. Uh, but I want to talk about this week, uh, some of our happier. Um, our time, bars are opening up tonight at midnight. And uh, that's fantastic for the guys that like to do that kind of thing. Um, but uh, for the more uh, conservative types, um, still we can get cocktails at home. And I think that's pretty neat in Texas that uh, we're able to do that. I know in Utah, where Joe's from, uh, that's not possible. Yeah, yeah, what the hell? How how exactly does that work, Stephen? <laughs> the governor likes to drink. I don't know. Uh, Abbott? Okay. <laughs> I'm moving to Texas. <laughs> you that's, it. It all. that's it i'm there and uh, he also announced that uh that, that after covid scares over that it may just stay that way so that'll be pretty neat um it's not cheap uh kenny do you have a uh, uh, alcohol deliveries in uh, california 
I'm sorry, say that again, Steve. You have alcohol deliveries in California? I know you're in San Diego. No, no, no. I, don't, I don't need to because I'm self-delivery. I have 20 cases <laughs> of everything I need to get me through the next four viruses. So don't worry about me and cocktail delivery. <laughs> and Lisa has tons of wine on the end, I'm sure, right? Yes. <laughs> I do, I do. I actually have a, a, a friend in the wine business who counts his wine in calories. There so that if, if we were in a, a post-apocalyptic setting, he and his wife know exactly how many calories they have to consume. Oh, no. Uh, Seven million it, calories. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's over a million calories. It is. That's I probably pretty funny. keep on hand three to 400 bottles of wine at a time at, at my house. Okay. So, yeah. I know when I'm, I'm in Dallas, I know where I'm going. Right. So Lisa yeah, Barn Girl. I'm, I'm like a... I'm like a FEMA bunker, basically. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, um, I'll tell you what, when you're in Dallas, uh, there's a lot, a lot of choices for, uh, for uh, booze delivery, if you will. Um, I know that uh, Las Almas Rotas. Have you been there, Lisa? Mm hmm. That's uh, a really good place over in Expo Park. Uh, a Mescaleria. So you get lots of Mescal on hand. And uh, I really like that place quite a bit. Uh, they uh, uh, have Ray Campanero and. Um, they have cocktails and, and uh, recycled Coca-Cola bottles, and it's a pretty neat place. But uh, you're able to get margaritas and margarita mix, and uh, all those delivered uh, from uh, eight dollars to fifteen dollars for a mix, and twenty to forty-five dollars for bottles of alcohol. And uh, the servings vary, so uh, you might want to check that out. Also, Jose, um, they've got a really good deal on margaritas too, so I enjoy that place quite a bit. Um, so check those places out. That's all the news I have for today. Well, very enlightening, Steve. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I am going to order some cocktails, except I only have to walk down the stairs after the show and I'll order up what I need. Right. I'm sure you can ring a bell and, and ask your maid to bring you something. Correct. <laughs> She's waiting. She's waiting to hear the bell. Right, right. Yeah, right, I did what's some up? cocktails. Oh, I did some cocktails to go over the last few weeks and they, they come in mason jars which is a nice little takeaway. And then I turn them into salsa and give them back to my accounts. Nice. Very <laughs> nice. Beautiful. All right, uh, Joe. So we got Kenny's uh, Vegas review, man. What, what, uh, what, which two restaurants are you going to talk about, Kenny? Well, uh, I'm going to take us to the Aria Hotel, uh, which is, you know, one of the newer, most beautiful, cool, hip hotels in Vegas. If you haven't been there, you have to go. There's a slew of restaurants. I'm reviewing two restaurants I really, really like, and they're not even my top two list from the Aria. That's how many good places there are to eat there. But uh, I want to talk about uh, Julian Serrano. And uh, it's really weird, man. He, he has a place in a Bellagio that is so below average, I probably never review it. And then his place in the Aria is absolutely ridiculously great. And I don't know what the disconnect is because it doesn't make sense to me. You know, it's one chef, you know, a little bit of different concepts, but I'm only going to talk about his topless bar in the Aria. Uh, and I'm going to tell you the dishes that if you go there, if you don't eat these, you're really missing out. Okay. Uh, and everything's a really small plate there, right? Tapas, obviously. There's no major, you know, uh, entrees. But uh, two of my favorites are the white asparagus that he does and the Spanish tortilla, the tuna carpaccio, ridiculous, the sea bass ceviche, magical with a great crispy Sauvignon Blanc. For hot tapas, he has a half a lobster. It's, it's insane. He's got the uh, U.S. How's that uh, He puts it, it, it's like roasted chili peppers, red peppers. He has like a, a, a chili, sort of a chili sauce with it and some roasted vegetables around it. It's absolutely incredible. Uh, the octopus dish, the scallop dish, great. But one of my favorites is the tender and crab. It's king crab seasoned and grilled, which is weird, but it's amazing, with a little bit of sliced tenderloin. Of course, every restaurant, Steve, you know I go to, I eat foie gras. If it's on the menu, I'm going to try it. Right. The foie gras they do is very nice. Not the best I've had in Vegas, but it's good. Right. And a weird, weird tapas that I love, I like flipped out over it, was stuffed dates with goat cheese and bacon. The oh, bacon yeah. was smoked. Absolutely amazing. It's Another one I really loved was the braised oxtail 
with pear and a red wine mayo. Absolutely amazing. If you want a big meal there, get the paella, the seafood paella, phenomenal. And then for dessert, the Spanish bread pudding. It's incredible. Julian, get your people over to the Bellagio and fix that restaurant there. Okay, moving on. There's a little French place upstairs called Bardo. They do brunch, lunch, dinner. Um, I'm just going to talk about brunch first. The foie gras parfait, Steve, is something. The first time I took a bite of it, I thought of you. Hey, describe it's that insane. to me. I, I didn't hear about that parfait. It, it, it's in a parfait glass. There's whipped mascarpone cheese. There's like an apple uh, cherry compote. And then this creamy foie gras. It, it, it's absolutely insane. That's a, how many forget about it does that get? Uh, three forget about it. So I, I mean, I, I just love it. And, uh, you know, if you're hungover, which I never am, uh, the Nutella sticky bun for brunch is nice. But here's nice. a dish I'm totally wild about. It's called the Hunter's Waffle. And it's a glazed duck confit on a waffle. It's their take on chicken and waffles in Spain. Their nice. signature dish, Steve, you won't believe this, French toast. I'm only going to say this. I'm not going to describe it. I'm not going to tell you anything about it. In <laughs> life, once in your life, go to the Aria, get the French toast for brunch. You won't even believe it. It's that insane. I will give you a little hint. The vanilla mascarpone tops it off. The brioche bread is like the best I've ever had. Okay. Yeah, color of brioche. Moving on real quickly. The croissant Benedict. Kale, Bernays, prosciutto, and short rib. Different, cool, innovative. Black truffled fries as a side. Loved it. For dinner, the chicken with the – it's a half-roasted chicken with a mushroom bread pudding, like – was way better than the chicken. It, it, I loved it. Kenny, what, what yeah. kind of mushrooms are in that bread pudding? That sounds insane. It, it, it's a mix, you know. Oh. It, it's a mix. They, they, they like four different mushrooms in there. Uh, the beef wellington standard, but really well done. Great dish. The smoked pork chop watching. they have is great. Bardo, I love that place. The problem with Bardo, it's right next door to two of my favorite restaurants that I'll be talking about in the near future, Carbone and John George Steakhouse. But Bardo, keep doing what you're doing. Insane. Love it. You go to Vegas, you go to those restaurants, tell them the wine czar sent you. They'll probably kick you out. Thank you, guys. <laughs> hey, uh, Kenny, real quick before you uh, cut away, um, why, tell us why we're doing Vegas because it's so important that uh, we support that city and it's, it's, uh, it's a major economy. Well, you know, here's what's going on, right? If they get a 50% occupancy, the whole city is going to open up. And uh, as the summer, as we get closer and closer to summer, they're going to push to have uh, more events there, right? Because what do we go to Vegas for? Right. Gambling, laying at the pool. We don't really want social distancing at a pool, especially when you're in your 30s and 20s. Uh, so that's going to be an issue. Uh, concerts, sporting events, all the things that are taken away right now will slowly reopen. But the main thing is, as we've seen in Talking Stick Casino in Arizona, some of the casinos here in San Diego where I live, they opened up. There were lines around the block. Trust me, I don't care if people have to take a stagecoach with six horses. They're getting to Vegas. June 1st is the opening date. I'll be there June 4th, by the way. Uh, it's going to be nuts, and I hope the city kicks some ass. It's my favorite place on the planet. And I'm in Utah, and I'm very, very close. I can drive to, uh, to Vegas, so uh, Joe and I may join you. Yeah, we're well, coming. We're going to tear it find up. Me. Well, well, here's the deal, Lisa. You'll love this. Uh, cause, and I'll be with my buddy Johnny, Big Johnny. Uh, we, and we, we're in a high limit bar where our wine by the glass is either Mouton or Camus Special Select. Those are our two choices. All right? Not too shabby. On the house, too. <laughs> Sounds really right. good. Yeah. So let's have some fun. Meet you guys in Vegas. Right on. Well, man, Kenny. You're making me hungry, man. Every time I just get <laughs> these stomach rumbles, I don't know what the problem is, man, but those reviews are always insane. So thanks, man. Uh, um, you're welcome. Steven, so uh, tell us a little bit about uh, about our guest tonight. Yeah, uh, we have a, our guest is Ryan Carberry, Chef Ryan Carberry, and uh, he manages quite a few restaurants. Um, if you look at uh, the Stanley Hotel, it's got a slew of restaurants there. We'll be talking about those. Uh, Primo's uh, is making a comeback in the Sattler. Um, we'll talk about that as well. Uh, they just, his restaurant group bought Nosh from uh, uh, Avner Samuels. So we'll be talking about that and after the break. All right, guys, I am drinking 
wine tonight and drinking a Pinot Noir in appropriate glassware too. This matters. This is a, a Burgundy Riedel stem. stem. Um, but the Pinot that I'm drinking tonight, so we're still kind of in that transitional period here in Texas where the weather's not quite hot yet, but uh, certainly not cool. It's, it's rainy and humid here this week. So uh, last week I was drinking a rosé. This week I've transitioned into Pinot Noir for some heartier dishes with this rain coming in for the next week or so. Um, we chose this wine tonight, so we have a, an advertising campaign that you'll see on the radio show or the TV show, where the, the campaign is called Good Light, which I think is super important right now because we are looking for things that inspire hope and inspire goodness. Um, this advertising campaign is centered around Oregon and the Oregon winemakers, the Oregon grape growers, um, and it's really just trying to shed, again, light on this beautiful wine region um, that maybe sometimes doesn't get as much attention as its neighbor to the south, California. So uh, the wine is made by Joseph Wagner. Um, he, he tends to go by Joe Wagner. And Joe is the second oldest son of Chuck Wagner who created Camus Cabernet. Joe's a, um, a fifth generation winemaker and grape grower in Napa Valley. And he and his brothers and sisters and father and grandparents all are part of a little bit of a Napa royalty family um, in that they've created Camus, Camus Special Select, Conundrum. Um, Joe created Bell Gloss at the age of 19 years old. So he did this to make an homage to his grandmother. Um, her name is Lorna Bell, Gla Lorna Bell Gloss, excuse me. And he created an iconic Pinot Noir brand at the age of 19. Um, five years later, he created a little wine label called Maomi. You may have heard of it before. Um, and then in 2014, he sold that label for $315 million. Now, this was unprecedented in the wine business because it actually didn't include any lands. It didn't include any production or winemaking team. It was honestly just the right to bottle and label a wine Maomi. $315 million. So with that 315 million, Joe was able to start a bunch of new passion projects. And one of the first wineries that he started at that point was Elowan. So Elowan is similar to Naomi in that it, it includes three winemaking regions in Oregon. We all know Willamette Valley. And just a, a fun little moniker for people too, it is Willamette and uh, not, not Willamette. And the way that you remember it is Willamette, damn it. So Willamette Valley, the Rogue Valley, and the Umpqua Valley in Oregon. So we blend grapes from all three of those regions together into a really affordable, lovely, everyday Pinot Noir. Um, the campaign Good Light in the name Elowan means good light. And this was created because uh, Santa Barbara is, is about as south as you can get growing grapes in the United States. And then Willamette Valley, um, up, up that Pacific coastline, is about um, as far north as you go in Oregon. Of course, you go into Washington State above. But as you creep up the coastline, those daylight minutes get incrementally longer. And this matters in winemaking because you need, you need sunlight, you need hang time, you need, you, need, um, you, know, you need longevity on the vine to ripen your fruit. So at the summer solstice, there are about 45 additional minutes of daylight in Oregon as compared to Santa Barbara. So that's where the name Good Light came from. A little fun fact about Joe is he actually has six children. And Elowan was on a short list of names for one of his daughters. And his wife would not agree to the name. So whereas most sane and rational people say, well, fine, I'll just get a dog and name it Elowan. Joe was like, no, I'm going to buy a winery and name it Elowan. So <laughs> that's what he did. <laughs> but uh, like I said, so transitioning into these warmer months, you know, we're seeing people kind of move away from red, red blends and Cabernets and transition into these softer, lighter wines. Um, I was out in the market today with uh, a bunch of, of wine buyers and wine stewards in the retail world. The price point that we're seeing right now with the explosion in foot traffic in the retail setting is $20 to $25. Now, this wine is on a retail shelf for about $19.99 on average. If you're lucky, you can find it for $17.99 in some places, but your average MSRP is going to be about $19.99 on a shelf. Um, this wine is versatile in that you can pair it with beef 
or you can slide into uh, some heartier, richer fish dishes as well. It's beautiful with pasta with the, you know, the right components to it. Um, Texans in particular are really famous for pairing the wrong wines with filet. And, you know, filet is king and Cabernet is king in Texas. But with the amount of marbling on a filet, which is actually quite um, small in comparison to ribeyes and, and bigger bone and cuts, uh, the marbling really doesn't stand up to a heavy Cabernet. The, the tannins in the Cabernet are much too powerful for that minimal amount of marbling in, in filet. And we're talking even prime filet. So what you really want to do is find a hearty but, but supple Pinot Noir to pair with your filet. When you do that, the marriage of those two um, components together, the, the marbling in your steak will take on more of a caramelized texture and the tannins in your wine soften and it's this beautiful marriage together that really is a classic pairing. So we're going to toast to uh, Elawan tonight, the, the good light wine out of Oregon. And you can find this at most local retailers as well as some fine wine shops in and around Dallas. Um, this wine is distributed nationally. So if we have viewers and listeners out in California and out in Las Vegas, you know, fans of the wines are, uh, you, should, you should be able to find this <laughs> wine at, at, well, at any fine just, wine shop. Just, <laughs> just so you know, the, the fans are now international, Lisa. They're international. They, they, they're growing on a daily basis. But I've got a question for you, okay? Sure. And, uh, Obviously, Mayomi, iconic brand, on the right years for $15 to $16 a bottle, the most incredible Pinot ever. Big, luscious fruit, soft. It fits the, it, it fits the U.S. palate. Now, the right. Oregon uh, Pinots, very Burgundian in style. You get right. a lot more earth. They're a little dirtier. I happen to love them. Ken Wright, Archery Summit. I can go on and, on and on and on and on and on, right? And uh, the question is, the wine that, uh, that Joe has made now, is it Burgundian in style or did he take it? Because there are some Oregon wines now that That's are getting more forward. Or are they yep. getting close to the California, like, uh, you know, Sonoma Pinot, which is gigantic? Right. So that's a really great question. And in fact, uh, the answer to the question is more of the latter of what you just spoke about. So Joe's a California kid and Joe made his name making uh, very approachable California style wines. Uh, Joe has a, a, a tagline or a slogan called go with your palate. And the idea behind go with your palate is the American palate is really geared toward a little bit of a sweeter style of wine. Now that, that word sweeter becomes kind of a dirty word in the wine industry because people are conditioned to think dry, dry, dry. I only like dry wines. The truth is in blind studies and in blind tastings, most of us gravitate towards a little bit of sweetness. Um, so Joe has definitely taken that California style Pinot Noir, which he made famous with Belle Gloss and Mayomi, and given it sort of an Oregon identity. So you definitely still get that Oregon earth, you know, that, that forest floor and, um, you know, that umami component, which is found in mushrooms and things, you know, and things like that, that savory characteristic, but there's certainly an homage to California found in this glass. Absolutely. And that's a, that's a great question. Um, sure. Definitely not Burgundian. So Burgundian to me is, Burgundian to me is about um, length and ageability and the patience to sit with the wine for a while. These wines are meant to be consumed young and immediately. They're an instant gratification wine. They're a wine that you can open on a Wednesday night by yourself and feel guiltless about it. You know, you're not breaking into your best bottles in your cellar. It doesn't necessarily have to be a celebration. It can be a celebratory experience or it can be completely unique and individual. It's a wine for the masses and it's for everyone to enjoy young and immediately. Lisa, awesome. may, may I see the bottle? Do you have it with yeah, you? Yeah, absolutely. So there's the bottle. And I'm drinking the Pinot Noir tonight, as we discussed, but there's also a rosé in this lineup, as well as a Chardonnay. Cool. Well, it's I'm, it's I'm going to get a bottle for this weekend, Lisa. And by the way, you are 100% accurate. That Any great Pinot with a filet is the perfect wine. Yep. Uh, I cringe when people used to order Cabernets with a filet, knowing that the wine would overpower the steak, especially a, a cut of prime beef gets lost. 
in the tannins and muscularity of a California calf. So great call, man. Uh, I'm great a huge call on fan the of uh, the Oregon Pinos. Huge yeah. fan. Yeah. You know, and Oregon has this little bit of an identity crisis in that they are, you know, the proximity to California, but then also the constant comparison to Burgundy. But if you've ever been to Oregon wine country, the winemakers and grape growers will, will assert every single time we're Oregonians, we're not Burgundians. So they certainly take some influences from both places and make the best style of wine that's appropriate for their growing region. Um, I think we're going to start seeing more and more people migrating to Oregon and maybe even Washington State as uh, prices of California wines continue to go up and up and get more and more expensive. But Pinot Noir and Chardonnay out of Oregon holds such a, such a soft spot in my heart. And like I said, this is just a really affordable, everyday wine that over delivers for the price point. The quality is there, the taste is there, and it's something that should be in everybody's uh, home cellar. Uh, so tell us uh, nice. uh, price point and where we can find that wine in Dallas. Sure. Um, your average retail price on this is going to be about nineteen ninety nine. Okay, if so you're right lucky. there, sweet spot. Yep. If you're lucky and can find it on sale somewhere, you might find it for around um, seventeen ninety nine. But some places that you can get this are definitely Total Wine and Spirits. Um, Central Market is a big supporter of this brand, Market Street. Your higher end um, Tom Thumbs and Kroger's with the, uh, the big fancy wine aisles will have this wine too. And then of course, local independent wine shops as well. And the best thing about your local indie retailers is uh, they are often way more inclined and available to bring in wines at their discretion based on their consumers. So if you have a favorite indie wine retailer, um, by all means, call them up and ask if they could bring in, you know, hopefully a case, but if not, you know, a handful of bottles. And that's a great way to, uh, to discover wines and explore wines that you may not be able to find readily in retail. But we work with all the major retailers um, here At in Texas. At that price point, it's nice to keep around a case uh, for yep. parties and simple occasions. Yeah, and, uh, it's beautiful dinner. And, okay, and Lisa, I tell you what, we're I, gonna. I, I have to. I have to ask Lisa one last question, Steve. Excuse me. What is the co-host price for this wine? <laughs> <laughs> the co-host price is actually more of an intangible price. It's it's about humility. Um, the co-host price requ requires you to pass the baton for one evening and recognize me as the actual number one rated wines are. There you go. Well, uh, you know, Lisa, in a fantasy world, we'd like to say that can happen. <laughs> but as we know, the only number one rated wine czar who has cut his teeth in the toughest market in the country, Dallas, is me, yours truly. <laughs> but you do an admirable job. You, I'm going to pass the torch to you eventually, just not right. yet, Grasshopper. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. I'll, I'll tell you what, uh, we're going to be back after this break, and uh, we're going to be talking uh, – with Sprout and uh, Joe will be talking to them. And uh, so let's have a word from our sponsor. Welcome back to the show. Uh, today we have a new addition, a good friend of mine from Nashville, Tennessee. He's a young rising star in the music business. He handles a lot of great artists, but he's got his finger on the pulse of the heartbeat of music that's going on in Nashville. And it ain't just country. Uh, our man Sprout will be here shortly. Buckle up for safety. Yeah, nice. Yeah, that was great. We can actually have a commercial out of that too, because the commercials are, the commercials are really short. So uh, we can actually yeah. run several. You know, sometimes on TV they uh, kind of come in and they say, yeah, we'll be right back after this break. Like, you just came back for a break. <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe hey, yeah, right. Now. Steve, while we're waiting for both those guys, um, should we have Lisa set up some commercials? Do you know who you're going to be promoting this show, Steve? Steve, oh, no. uh, Evan Russell is coming in. You guys ready? Yeah. Yep. Let's do it. All right, here he comes. Mr. Sprout. Hello. How's it going? Yeah. There you are. Yeah. All right. Welcome. Welcome. Okay. Hey, Sprout, thank you so much for being on the show. This is Kenny. Uh, I'll introduce you to everybody. Uh, we've got Joe, Steve, and Lisa on the show. You guys all say hello to my man, Sprout. How you doing? Yeah. Nice so I get it now. Brussels, Sprout. I got that now. That's right. Yep. 
Yep. It kind of fits in our uh, whole genre here of the food thing and booze thing. And welcome. Thank so you Kenny, very much. Kenny already <laughs> introduced you um, while, while we're waiting for you to come on. So you're already introduced. So when we go in, um, yep. we can just, you can just, Kenny can already talk to you in the, without an introduction because he's already uh, talked about you. Awesome. Okay. Very cool. So you, uh, what are you, you, you going to be discussing today? Uh, I believe we're discussing music in the uh, local Nashville scene. Okay, that's great. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know a whole lot about that, so I'm not sure I can contribute, but uh, these guys are really adept. Yeah, uh, I mean. At least yeah. at least he knows everything about everything. Very cool. And if you have other cool. questions, just feel I'm an open book. Feel free to ask. Cool. All right, All right. All Joe, right. Tell me, Joe, tell me when we're ready. All right, three, two, one, go. Okay, well, Sprout, welcome to the show, man. Great having you here. Thank you uh, for Tell me what's going on in uh, Nashville right now, man. Yeah, I mean, we're all kind of, uh, you know, surviving down here with everything going on in, in the world right now. Um, but things are opening back up at about 50% capacity. Um, it's, it's real interesting, you know, uh, being in Nashville and not having live music. Uh, one of the things that drew me to the city was, you know, going down Broadway and just, hearing live bands playing all the time. And, um, you know, you could walk into any bar uh, in, in the city and hear just incredible, incredible talent. Um, so it, it's weird, but, you know, I started a, a management company down here and we're keeping busy, we're doing well. So uh, that's, that's all I can ask for right now. Tell us a little bit about your management company, what you guys are doing and who you're handling. Yeah, we represent um, a bunch of different talent. I have two business partners. It's called Space Colonel Management. And we represent everyone from Shooter Jennings, Jason Bolin and the Stragglers, uh, Deep Blue Something, which had that song uh, Breakfast at Tiffany back in the 90s. Oh, uh, yeah. And I personally represent Travi McCoy and, and Gym Class Heroes. Wow. Uh, uh, producer Soren Hansen of the band New Politics and uh, this band called Issues, um, as well as Tyler Carter. So we've got our hands full, for sure. <laughs> that, that's Sprout. awesome. So tell me what uh, musicians are doing right now during this uh, lockdown, and no live music, no concerts, no touring. Yeah. What, uh, what are they doing, man? You know, it's, it's gone completely to, to live streaming, um, and that's really what, what people are doing, I think. You know, my thing is, with my artists is just stay busy stay out there let people know you're doing stuff um you know we've released a couple songs from a few of the artists um but you know streaming is actually down believe it or not like it's it's interesting because most people listen to it when they're at the gym when they're at you know in their car and no one's doing those things right now so believe it or not streaming's down um but with that being said people have you know reverted to live shows uh, sorry, live streaming shows. And, you know, that's kind of what, what we're doing as well. Um, you know, tomorrow we're putting out a video with, with Travi McCoy and, and Mark Cuban to celebrate his 10 year anniversary of uh, his song Billionaire with Bruno Mars. And that was initially supposed to be a, a few dates of a headlining tour, but obviously no one's touring right now. So we had to quickly, you know, change things up. And we partnered with, with Twitch and he's going to host like a 10 year anniversary party uh, live, live streaming on Twitch, bringing special guests, um, just, just about staying busy, getting his name out there. And, you know, it's, it's all online right now. Sprout, I have a question about streaming services being down. Yeah. Um, I'm, a, I'm a pretty avid music enthusiast myself. Um, sure. one, of my, one of my favorite uh, weekly experiences is as soon as new music releases at midnight on Friday, I'm the girl mining the mining the the platforms for new music and dumping them into a playlist. Yeah. But I've noticed that it seems like new music isn't coming out as as uh, abundantly as it was before. So is because is that because streaming is down? Are you delaying releases? You know, I think if you ask five different people, they're all going to have a little bit different you know um, assumptions on that. But personally, you know, when I put out nothing beats a live performance. Nothing beats being there, seeing the band, feeling the energy. And a lot of times around a new album, a new single, people are touring. Um, right. you know, I, I was a tour manager for, for many years. And 
when artists put singles out, we would do a whole tour around one song and we just can't do that right now. So right. touring sells music. I'm sorry. So touring sells music. Yep. 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 When you can get out there, when you can sell tickets, sell your merchandise, you know, and, and that's where artists, uh, in my experience, primarily make a lot of their money nowadays is, you know, the streaming is great, but unless you have millions of, of streams, you're not seeing a whole lot of revenue coming in. So it's, it's a hard time for, for a lot of artists, but, you know, to answer your question, my guess is just that they're, they're just more limited. Artists are more limited on the things they can do around a release. And I think a lot of people are, um, are holding out on, on new music right now. Um, it, it's funny, you know, a lot of bands, I think, had the mindset, you know, oh, everyone's home. We have their attention. This is great. And to an extent, yeah, sure. You know, I think if, if you're, you know, Justin Bieber or somebody like that, you're going to get a ton of attention. But for, for artists that are trying to build a fan base, it's, it's very, very difficult at this moment. Right. And it requires that touring personal touch. It's yeah. the same in the book industry right now, too. A lot of authors are delaying releases sure. because they can't do book tours. And so we're, we're kind of at an impasse in a lot of these places that are really fulfilling for us in, in our hobbies and interests. So, but that makes sense. And I'm glad you explained that to us because that's something that as a music lover, I've been wondering for quite a while. My, my playlists have been a little light <laughs> since quarantine. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's awesome you do that, though. I, I love looking at the New Music Fridays and, and stuff like yep. that coming out. So. It used to be New Music Tuesday. When did it become New Music Friday? With streaming? Uh, I, I guess, uh, yeah, Spotify, you know, has really just kind of, um, uh, you know, monetized this whole thing. And th their, their New Music Friday playlist is just, you know, that's like even more so than being on the radio nowadays. That's right. what artists want is that New Music Friday slot. So. It's, it's just, it's amazing the way in just the, la the last few years, um, you know, the music industry has, has changed because of that. Right. Sprout, yeah. I have a question for you about uh, space kernel management. Does that happen to be a David Bowie, like Major Tom reference there in the title? Or is that just, uh, wait, what's the story behind the name behind your company, I guess? You know, unfortunately, I'm not the best person to answer that. Um, my two business partners came up with the name and I, I kind of joined in a little later on. Um, but my partners are named uh, Adam Barnes and J.R. Denson. And Adam uh, looks after Shooter Jennings and uh, Jamie Wyatt. And he had a company called Kernel Management. And then J.R. is from Dallas where I'm born and raised. And um, he had a company called Space Camper Management. So they kind of took the two names put them together and you got space kernel. Um, awesome, and, and right around the time they were starting that I, uh, I was leaving a company and wanting to do my own thing. And JR was literally the first person I've, I'd ever met in the music business and trust him more than anyone and just wanted to be a part of what they were doing. So that's how it came about. That's way cool. What, what, uh, what were you doing before you were in the music business? That's a, I mean, that's a tough business to break into from the way I understand things to be. Yeah, it's, you know, one thing I love about it, and, and I talk to a lot of students at, at Belmont University here in Nashville, is, you know, it's, it's really cool and really scary because everyone in the music industry has, you can, you have such an opportunity to, to pave your own path. You know, my story is completely different from, every, you know, everyone else's, and it might be similar in certain ways, but you know, some people go to college and, and get a job right out of college. Some people work their way up. And I, uh, right out of high school, had a bunch of friends locally in Dallas. Um, they were going on tour in, in a van and trailer. And I said, hey, can I tag along and sling t-shirts for you? And they were like, yeah, sure. You know, we can't pay you anything. We're getting a hundred bucks a night. And it's one hotel room. And I was like, I don't care. This is what I want to do. And um, I ended up staying on the road almost consistently for, for six years after that. Um, you know, got to tour with art, artists like The Fray, Third Eye Blind, um, American Authors, New Politics. I just, you know, I got to see more of the world than I ever thought I would see in my lifetime. So, uh, you know, that, and th through that is where I met all my connections. And, um, you know, after six years of, of traveling, I just, I got tired and I wanted to, to work in a management company and, and worked for, for a management company in New York for a few years and decided to start my own venture just, just last September. 
That's pretty bold. Cool. Yeah, it's. I mean, you know, thank thank goodness it it worked out and wasn't wasn't an easy conversation to have with the parents at the right. time. You know? <laughs> but you know, I I just said, you know, look, I can I can go back to college if if I fall flat on my face and um, I don't know when I'm going to get an opportunity to to travel the country in a in a van with you know uh, and and do live music and. I, I really took it seriously. You know, one thing I tell students that I speak to is I didn't drink on the road. I didn't, you know, do any sort of drugs. I wasn't trying to, you know, meet girls. I was, I was there to work and I maintained a very high level of professionalism. I asked questions, learned what I could and, you know, th thank goodness it's paying off. So, um, I, I don't know. I think people have a lot, you know, they have a mentality about touring where, Oh, it's just, you know, you're partying every night and drinking and Turf hotel rooms. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. and yeah, I mean, of course, you know, that, that stuff happens with certain artists, but I was really lucky to surround myself with great like-minded people. And man, I, I was there to work and I, I luckily I, I got to move up, you know, in the ranks and work with bigger and bigger acts. And it, it was awesome. It was great. Do you have any? Uh, do you have any wild stories? I mean, I I know you were keeping it legit the whole time you were there, yeah. but uh, do you have any wild tour stories? That, uh, that you'd yeah, to sure. Um, you know, the last artist I ever toured with was was Diplo and and Major Lazer, and it's not a it's not a specific uh, instance, but you know, I just. I, you know, I was 25 years old at the time and I was tour managing Diplo who, you know, was, was in his late thirties. And it's just, it's, it's really, it's really something being, you know, in your mid twenties and having to put together schedules and tell people what to do in their thirties and forties. And, you know, we got to fly around in private jets, which was a totally new experience for me. We got to, you know, we did shows in Beirut, Lebanon, um, Israel, Dubai, Shanghai, China, and it, it was just, it, it was just an amazing time. Um, I know it's not a specific instance, but right. his shows were just uh, incredible. They were amazing. That, that's awesome. Sprout, I, I, I have a question for you because you mentioned you toured with Third Eye Blind, which happens to be my favorite band of the okay. 90s by a mile. Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, Jules and I just saw them at the uh, at the amphitheater here in San Diego, uh, about eight months ago, they're amazing. Yeah. What were they like? Because they sort of imploded as a band, and I was so bummed that after the first two albums, they sort of fell off. Yeah. What were they like on the road? They're you know it, you get to a certain point I think in in your career, and and again this this is different for for all acts, but you know f for with them like they've been doing this for so many years. They are just pros. They have the best crew you could have. They're professional, you know. And quite honestly, like you know, I became friends with with a lot of the band. Um, we're st we still talk to this day. And if they come through Nashville or when I was in New York, we'll still we'll still hang out. Um, but they've just been doing it so long that, you know, I don't want to say they're, uh, you know, they just kind of stay on the bus, do their own thing, keep to themselves. They're, it's like they're over the the partying they're over the right. whatever they did in the 90s and sure. it's like, this is this is their job like it, you know and they love it um they're extremely passionate about music and have been doing it for so many years but yeah they're 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 just normal guys and they're there to do a job it's it's work to them and um you know again love what they do but they're, they just don't really go out and, and see the, the cities like, you know, I was like a kid in a candy store. I was like, oh, we're in, you know, Detroit, Michigan. I've never been here. I'm going to go out and look. We're in, you know, Boise, Idaho. What, what, what's around here? And, you know, in Philly, I got to get a Philly cheesesteak. And it's like, yeah, I, I was new and just like, you know, wanted to do everything. And they, they just kept to themselves a lot of the time. Cool. Because really, I know, yeah. you know, in, in the 90s, uh, drugs and party and imploded the band. Uh, yeah. The new guitarist they have is absolutely ridiculous. He didn't Correct. miss a note. And I literally know every note to every song. The guy, they were incredible to see live. And it just yeah. blew me away because I had always missed them when they had come around in the 90s. But, uh, sure. yeah, they were awesome. That's cool. Hey, quick question for you, man. Uh, 
you know, obviously there's a lot of lost revenue right now with this lockdown and bands are going to be scrambling. Uh, have you ever put together any kind of like weird marketing deals like the way Kenny Chesney did with his rum brand that he brought out on the road with them and turned, you know, rum and Kenny Chesney music into a party. Have you ever thought of doing that with any of, uh, you know, your acts like uh, with some of Lisa's wines from the Camus family? <laughs> yeah. how, how, how's that promotion, Lisa? <laughs> <laughs> awesome that's awesome uh shameless yeah <laughs> yes yes to answer your question it's it's a very uh, it's very new to me um you know because having my own company now i just i have the freedom to do uh, a lot a lot more um and be more hands-on with everything um but yeah like for travi you know we're talking to a brewery uh in upstate new york where he's from and you know, we're talking about doing a, uh, a specific beer on his next tour. Um, I manage, you know, some people who, you know, we're talking to a toy company about making toys for them. And yeah, I'm, you know, definitely looking into licensing deals and trying to, you know, think, okay, if, if we can't tour for however long it's going to be, how can we generate some revenue? You know, even if it's going to take a year to develop those deals, how can I start to be, you know, proactive and, and, you know, get revenue from my artists outside of, you know, them just being on the road, because the truth is, is, you know, they're not going to want to tour forever or, you know, even if they do it, you know, they can't, they can't tour every year. They're going to have to write albums and, you know, maybe, and take breaks. And, um, this, this whole, uh, you know, time everyone's going through has really taught me a lot and it's, it's, you know, a little uncomfortable, but it's, again, I, just, I wouldn't have it any other way. I'm, I think I'm busier in different ways than I ever have been and learning so much. And, um, and yeah, definitely exploring more licensing deals and brand partnerships. Very right. cool. Yeah. Sprout, I have, I have another question for you. I was uh, fortunate enough to see a show at the Ryman Auditorium uh, two years ago yeah. and conveniently and coincidentally, they were uh, kind of Tennessee darlings. It was a colony house. Oh yeah. <laughs> So obviously, I'll, you know, the, the Ryman is iconic and historic. Are there any other venues that you're partial to or I think that deserve, you know, equal attention or similar attention to the Ryman in, in Nashville? Grand Ole Opry is, I've never done a show there, never worked a show there, but, you know, I saw, um, have you guys seen that, like, Yodeling Boy on uh, online? And yes. Yeah, I have. Yeah. Ma Mason Ramsey. <laughs> I right. saw him, I thought he was playing the Opry and I got tickets and, you know, just as a spectator, there's magic in that, in that building. Right. And that was, the Grand Ole Opry is, is just phenomenal. What about small intimate shows for indie artists, you know, that maybe aren't big enough to make it onto those stages? Do you have any favorite little, you know? I love Cannery Ballroom, the High Watt. It's, it's a small room. The High Watt, for example, is 200 people, but, you know, it's, Sounds great. It's a cool venue. The staff is professional. I'd recommend the, the high watt and, and cannery ballroom any day. Very cool. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Thank you so much for coming on Sprout. Uh, do you have a website or social media yeah. account or something that uh, people could check out uh, you or your artists on? Yep. Space Colonel MGMT.com and my Instagram is Evan Brussels Sprout. So <laughs> follow me, check out the website. Absolutely and talk to you guys soon. Thanks for having me. So, uh, thank, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate it. We'll see ya. Thanks. Right, have a good okay. night. Well, thank you. Ryan Carberry, how are you doing today, Chef? Doing outstanding. How's everyone? Oh, fantastic. Um, we're, whoa, you turned out. Okay, there you are. Um, Sorry, let's, start over. Okay, let's start over again. Hey, Ryan Carberry, how are you doing today? Outstanding. How are you? Fantastic, Chef. Uh, where are you right now? Right now, I'm in a uh, back uh, back parking lot, enjoying uh, a wonderful evening. Uh, I had a little chef dinner going on, and uh, okay, you know, I was told uh, we had a little confusion on uh, timing, so I wanted to make sure I made it for this uh, outstanding, uh, outstanding uh, uh, show. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that, Chef. Uh, we really, uh, Kate and I, particularly wanted to have you on um, because of our our time together and uh, you know our history. Uh, no, I appreciate that, but um, anyway, uh, so, um, so how's the settler these days? 
well, the Sadler, I mean, itself, well, we obviously got a uh, word from, uh, you know, Governor uh, Abbott that we we're going to go to uh, 50% on Friday. So we're uh, uh, wildly excited about the opportunity to move forward on uh, expanding our business. Uh, but, you know, the Sadler is uh, ever changing as always. Right. So we are including, uh, I've got a new uh, Italian pizza and meatball concept that's coming out. Really? Tell us about that. We're, we're, it's called uh, Spearco. And uh, it's everything spirit. So, you know, pizza, meatball, uh, very fun, very exciting. Um, you know, again, it, it ties into a lot of my background, a lot of my history. You know, Kenny, I know, uh, you know, Kenny being, uh, you know, New York Italian, uh, lover of all Italian things, uh, number one, uh, true and dear to our hearts. But, I'm glad uh, you brought that up, Ryan. Number oh, one, no. <laughs> number one rated always number one <laughs> it's funny since the last time we talked i i've been around town and i uh, had a lot of a lot of good opportunity to speak with uh uh himself bob sample who who again uh reminded us all about the wine czar oh, Lauren, no. how are you <laughs> um but reminded us all about the wine czar so i uh, had some great laughs chopped it up at uh bob's steak and chop house here in dallas but uh back to what i was saying about spherco it's just a fun, uh, fun opportunity with pizza, pasta, salad, uh, meatballs. So, uh, what QSR, space is that going to go in? Uh, it's going to go into uh, a little space uh, to the side to the side of where uh, uh, Fine China was. Okay, so good, we're actually okay. putting Primos, the second location of Primos there, and uh, so we'll have Primos two downtown. Right. When's that we'll opening have, up? Uh, that'll be uh, mid June to July. I got you. And I got Spirco opening uh, in two weeks. Nice. Okay, quick, quick question, Chef. And obviously, yes. uh, you know, you and I work together in an Italian concept, so I know what you can do Italian-wise. Uh, pizza near and dear to my heart and my belly. Uh, what kind of oven are you using to make this pizza? And what style of pizza are you throwing down? So what we're doing, uh, so we've got uh, just a deck oven, right? Uh, we're doing Baker's Pride, which is a great okay. brand. Happy to be, happy to be using them. Uh, but it's not, you know, Neapolitan, date pizza. We're talking football pizza. You know, I know there's a, a great deal. One bite, everybody knows the rules. Uh, you know, El Presidente, Dave Portnoy from Barstool Sports. has a great little, uh, great little gimmick going on uh, trying all the pizza around uh, the country to tell you who's number one. Uh, I will tell you, we are at the top. Um, Obviously, I would tell you, you know, being biased, if you want to grade my pizza, I would tell you it's a, uh, it's a, uh, you know, anywhere from uh, an 8.7, 8 to a 9.3, well, which are very strong scores. Precise. Hi, Marks. <laughs> well, yeah. I, 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 I'll tell you what, Chef, I, as soon as this lockdown's over, I'll be flying out to Dallas to sample that pizza with you. I'm also curious, because again, I've had your... Italian food besides your steakhouse fare. Tell me about the meatballs. How many different kind of meatballs are you making? You know, so we've got a uh, we've got a, uh, a, a an inspiration from New York. It's called Meatball Shop. So we're gonna do uh, five or six different meatballs, uh, plant based, vegetable based. We're gonna do the Italian stallion or the Italian tradition with our normal uh, Italian meatball. We've got some uh, burn in meatballs nice. coming at you. But we're wow. gonna do uh, five or six different sauces, and then we've got. Uh, if you want to make it a bowl, uh, you're gonna add your pasta. So we're gonna have handmade spaghetti. We'll have handmade rigatoni, ha really? handmade ditalini. Uh Then we'll do uh, a little, uh, a little bit of uh, a. We'll have a grain, a daily grain, um, and then we're gonna do our polenta. So very nice, really fun. Kind of you know. Look for, that's so two weeks right for that. I'm sorry. In two weeks, we're looking forward to that. We're going to send yes, Lisa out yeah. to check it out. Yes. Two weeks, we're going to come so, out. Press release is coming out. We're excited. Yeah, Chef. Sure. Um, I, you know, I, I'm making no assumptions as to who has uh, remained on staff with you there, but I'm really good friends with Johnny Caros and uh, hey, Chef, Chef Bill and I have uh, some history together as well. Bill, will? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. Yeah. Yeah, Bill, we love Bill. Uh every uh, obviously Johnny Caros, uh, you know, you gotta say, you know, period, the end. Yada yada yada. <laughs> right? The end. Yes. Period, the end. 
Yada, Believe yada. it or not, um, Johnny Johnny is is kind of one of my big brother mentors, and then Kenny's the other. Like, I, I'm kind of screwed, aren't I, with both of those guys? Right right yeah, that's <laughs> so not good, Lisa. No, it's a, it's a tough deal because Kenny, I'm going to tell you right now, uh, you know, is somewhat somewhat similar when I met Johnny um, as meeting you, Kenny. Uh, you know, you got that New York bravado. You got the man's man. You know that if I got to go to ask for a bet, I know I'm going in for a lock, which is outstanding. Um, but you know what? At the end of the day, Johnny, same way with you, Kenny, always near and dear and, and takes care of his people. So um, when I met Johnny, I knew that it, it was similar attributes that Kenny had. Obviously, uh, you know, often imitated, never duplicated. As I would say for Kenny Cosway, there's only one, <laughs> not one. So clearly, I have a tight. <laughs> so uh, real quick, I want to I find out about um, how Nosh, how your group came over, uh, came to take over Nosh from Aver Samuels. Want to tell you me know, about it, that? Yeah, so it, you know, fun, uh, fun little deal. I, and obviously, every day uh, things evolve, things change. Um, uh, we had a great opportunity to uh, carry on Nosh, and it, it's not really take over or, or anything like that. It, we had the opportunity to carry on and uh, right. to move forward with, uh, you know, with the times and everything that we, you know, we we're experiencing with, um, you know, everything going on in our world and, and times. Uh, but again, I, I say carry on. Uh, we're right. looking at the opportunity with the location being in Park Cities, having an opportunity to really engage our neighborhood and remind them that, you know, you can have a uh, phenomenal uh, glass of wine, bottle of wine, uh, certainly with our partners. I mean, you know, the, the Gallo family has been outstanding to us. Uh, Southern Spirits, Southern Glazers has been a phenomenal partner to us and, and helping us get, you know, get through um, the pandemic and, and get through this. And, and at the end of the day, you know, they were saying to us and we were saying to them, like, we are all in this together. And it really was uh, a great representation. So it made sense for us to carry on the Nosh brand. Uh, I obviously was a chef for Abner at the Oak Lawn store and right. uh, was able to kind of sink my teeth into uh, the Dallas dining scene. And, you know, that was before my, uh, my you know, 70s baseball trade to uh, another restaurant tour here in town, uh, Edward Bailey. And, I remember that. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, That's a classic I, you know, story. A few, a few hundred thousand dollars in uh, a stove, which is like back in the day, you know, give me the left-hander in the whirlpool and you got a deal. Oh, so, no. uh, <laughs> it, it, you know, it was a fun deal. But, you know, going through that, it, it honestly was, uh, you know, being apprehensive as I was, uh, literally it opened, my, opened my world um, to, a whole, to a whole new world. You know, I, I had the opportunity to meet, you know, obviously Kenny, uh, Kenny, the number one, Cusway, Wine Czar. Uh, then I met Mark Thank Lindbergh. You. Thank you. Uh, Chrissy Rather. Um, it just uh, tremendous people in the industry who were, were titans and are titans. So, yeah. uh, as a young man, I mean, it, you know, even Steve and you and I, you and I actually broke bread there, uh, and you know, kind of, kind of buried uh, a little animosity and uh, uh, you know, buried a little bit of the hatch there. Right. You say there's some animosity. I don't know what it was, but oh no, it's if you say there is, there was. <laughs> Oh, uh, Steve! Wait, know that. Wait, wait. I absolutely love you. No, Steve never wrote a negative review in his life. There couldn't have been oh, any animosity. Get out of here! Get out All of right. here! He had I, one. I, he had one. It was about me. Uh, oh no! Oh, <laughs> Steve, what the <laughs> hell, brother? Red Fork. I, I couldn't believe I, it. it was Red Fork. You know, Red and, Fork. Uh, I love Red know, Fork. What it? You know, and it's funny. Okay, so in the whole world of restaurants, and and it goes through um, an enormous amounts of ups and downs, and everybody thinks, hey, man, you know. I got a I got a few jingles in my pocket. I can be a restaurateur, right? Everyone wants their you know wants a ring kiss. Everyone wants to come in and feel like a big shot, feel great. They want to own a restaurant. Uh, you you get in there and you realize it's a lot of work. Um, the margins are really small. It's every you, day. You, yeah, it's every day. You absolutely have to love what you do, and and you have to absolutely understand people because at the end of the day, it's people that are going to make you. And it's people that are going to break you. So they're either going to, they're going to, you're going to be so thrilled with them or they're going to let you down. Right. Um, and it is, Sorry. it's a human business. 
Um, it, it's a compassion business. It's a love business. It's a, it's certainly a hate business. I mean, it, it's everything you could think of. When you ever see the movie Rocky, and you understand how many rounds you go through, and you know you're getting beat, you're getting beat, you're getting beat. I mean, it's like the American. It's the American story. It's the American or the underdog story. I would say. Right. Um, it is. It, it's. It's not for the faint of heart. Um, but you meet so many wonderful people, and even through uh, trials and tribulations, some of those things you, you find yourself in a, a wonderful friendship where, you know, Stephen and I, you know, Steve, you and I have, um, you know, Kenny, you and I, you know, developed our relationships through there. You know, Lauren, like we have met through, you know, doing wine and, and everything, how we met through Bailey's. I mean, it was so yeah. funny to find out that you were doing the show and I'm like, holy cow, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. So, yeah. Uh, one, one I got it. I got to share one quick story because I don't know what happened at Red Fork, Steve. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna put this to rest. But uh, and and this is really a testament to Ryan. It was a weird took, deal. I'm gonna tell you that much. Yeah. All right. Well, we're gonna we're gonna get past that. But when 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 we took over the Bailey's uh, Prime Plus Steakhouses, uh, that was like going into Berlin in 1946. It was an absolute disaster. And uh, Chef and I sat down almost every night and discussed what we thought our concept would be to make a steakhouse that would blow away. And, and, and Chef, man, he put it together. And I ate it every night. And we ate together. And we discussed every dish, every nuance. And then, Steve, I'll never forget it when you came in. I was scared shitless because I didn't really know you that well. And I realized you could have buried us, man. And I, I just recently looked at all the articles that were written in Dallas, you know, about Bailey's Prime Plus, about Chef Ryan, me. And, man, it, it was amazing. And, and one thing I want to do on his show, Steve, and you'll love this, is that I really want to give a shout out to Jennifer Jocko. Although she didn't last with us, she was the uh, psalm at Bailey's Prime Plus who oh, really put Pally. together one of the greatest yep. sellers ever. The problem one, was we yeah. couldn't sell the wine to that crowd. But that was, Jennifer, yeah. if you're listening, I want to tell you that me, Ryan, and Steve Doyle drank all your wine selections. We love you. Hey, Mark, you I appreciate it. <laughs> we love you. The, the wine was outstanding. I'll tell you again and again, you know, uh, you know, my partner on, you know, with Refine and uh, All Star is Robert Hall. And uh, Robert is, um, you know, his grandfather started Robert Hall Vineyards in Paso Robles. And, you know, even understanding his acknowledgement of the palate that Jennifer had is, is through the roof. So, I mean, she really built an incredible seller, grew an incredible seller, and, um, you know, I, I, I salute you for, for being able to appreciate it. Oh, In fact, uh, her, her wine it. sections, uh, her, that wine cellar was built uh, for Wine Spectator. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, I so, mean, you know, she had the greatest vertical collection of Cecilia Vega, uh, which at the very end, of, before we close those restaurants, Steve, you, me, and Ryan drank that wine with the sous vide veal chops. So Jennifer, well, I think, again, I think, you, hey, I Kenny, I think uh, you may, I think you may still have a scar on the bottom of your foot from that. Oh, <laughs> stepping on that wine glass. Remember that? Yeah, I stepped hey, on that wine. Can glass I ask a question right though? My shoe. Can I ask a question? How's the yes. hand doing? What did? Oh, from the dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's uh, so it's you got a little PTSD. Healing. Yeah, it's still, still, it's still healing up from that attack dog. <laughs> it's still tender. That's a, whole, that's a whole other side story for another day. That's very good. Okay, uh, Ryan, uh, I don't know we have a few more minutes with you, so I want to, I want to talk a little more about Nosh, and then I want to find out about Tillman's. Uh, Nosh, what are we talking about uh, culinary wise? Is it still over the top, crazy culinary experience, or have you tamed it down a little bit? No, I, I, it's uh, you know over the top culinary experience. I'm not sure if we even touch that in doing Nosh. Uh, you know, I think Aurora was over the top corner experience. I mean, right. Nosh was the bistro. Um, so when we talk about, you know, it, it's hard to talk about a bistro and say, you know, over the top corner experience. Um, well, you know, a short rib's a short rib, a steak frites is a steak frites, you know, uh, a, a, a sandwich is a sandwich, right? Uh, right. But you're always going to get phenomenal ingredients, great technique, amazing presentation, and even above and beyond hospitality you're right. going to be treated like gold um 
you're gonna be treated, you know, you may have the worst day going on for you. You step into that room, the moment you're greeted, you're greeted uh, with, with warmth. You, we welcome you in. Uh, and that's, you know, I think that's really where it kind of separates it. Um, but even going further, you know, when you're a sophisticated palate and you want to enjoy a great, you know, bottle or, or glass of wine, and anywhere you go, it's $17 a glass, and you, you know, you're drinking your same glass, you drink it, you know, you go to a Specs, or obviously we love Specs, and um, our partner's there, but um, y- you know, you know what it costs. So why right. am I going to drink, a, you know, $17 when I could buy, you know, a decent bottle for $27, $28? Um, it kind of, it makes it a little difficult. So the one thing you're going to find is that it, it, it's not going to break the bank. It's uh, approachable. It's uh, 100% uh, quality, and, and, and it's, it's sophisticated. Sounds really good. Okay, tell us, um, and absolutely love Nosh. Uh, tell us about Tillman's. We closed Tillman's and uh, Bishop Arts. I think it's coming back. No, you know, honestly, uh, Tillman's, uh, unfortunately, uh, we love Tillman's. I think the world of Till- Tillman's, but um, that was with uh, a previous partner, and we're going to, uh, we're actually going to do what Kenny just did, and we're just going to go like this <laughs> and say next. Okay? I got you. Kenny, you got to work out your yeah, tickets. Next. I, had, I, I had a little problem trying so, to adjust you know, the I, I don't I, want Joe I would to like yell to talk, at me. You know, I would like to talk a little bit, you know, talking about Tillman's. Forget Tillman's. Let's talk about Primo's coming at the Statler. Let's do that. Um, really, really, really excited uh, to tie in Spherco with the pizza and the meatballs laid back atmosphere, laid back approach to then going into Primo's, uh, the second Primo's at the Statler. Everybody knows the Statler, historic hotel, Hilton Hotel, 1956. I mean, literally, if you want to know the history of it, uh, uh, that is, uh, that was literally uh, the Rat Pack era. Um, You had so many stories that came out musically that, you know, stars stayed there. Uh, but what we are doing, it's a, it's a party hotel. It's a fun hotel. It's where you're going to go lay your hair down. So to be able to tie in Spherical with pizza, meatballs, uh, you, got that, you got that going to 4 a.m. Now you got Primo's with Tex-Mex, Mexican tequila. Uh, we got private dining rooms. We tie that into Waterproof Upstairs, which is a rooftop pool and bar. We have Scout, uh, which is our open, open room deal. Even right now at 25%, we still have uh, occupancy of 120 people. Wow. It's outstanding that even gives further than six to eight feet distancing. Outstanding. Um, and then we go to Bourbon and Banner, which is our speakeasy downstairs. And then once you wake up at whatever time you like, uh, you hit over easy and you get a little breakfast, uh, breakfast launch. So Sounds great. kind of round it out there. And then we have a few other developments going on here in DFW that you know, we'll talk about here coming up, but Flower Mound is one of them. We're doing a river walk at Central Park there. Uh, really, really excited about. Um, you know, we've got Collin Creek Mall. We've got uh, a few other developments here in DFW that, uh, you know, we'll be talking about here in the near future. Okay, hopefully with us. Of course. Okay. <laughs> Ryan. Right. Right. Uh, your, your group Ryan. is just amazing. Ryan, I'm a, I'm a staycation kind of gal a lot of times when I can't get out of town, and I've stayed at probably all the major hotels in your, in your competitive set in Dallas and, you know, the Adolphus and the Jewel and Zaza and even the Anatole, but you guys have the sexiest and swankiest hotel in my opinion. Uh, the mid-century modern vibes are just so inviting and warm and those big giant bathtubs. I absolutely adore the Statler. And when I have friends in town, that's the first place that I send them. Well, you know, not the bathtubs are outstanding, and what you're saying, I I cannot agree more. Obviously, biased. Um, really enjoy the hotel, but I can tell you, just being fourth generation in in uh, hospitality industry, walking in this building and having the ability to walk in and and see the marble and the handrails. I mean, these are all they've been there since 1956. Eh? It blows my mind, and to know who walked the halls. I mean. Um, you know, we had uh, Ike and Tina, uh, you know, the infamous, you know, that's where I, you know, Tina finally left Ike, was in uh, 
was in Dallas, Texas, and was at the Stellar Hotel, and she wow. finally had enough and said, you know, uh, you know, kind of the hashtag Me Too movement, and said, hey, forget about you. Okay, I ain't doing this no more. Hey, we're, we're, I'm going to be rolling, you know, forget you. Um, but yeah, no, it was at the Statler. They, uh, they had a big ballroom deal set up. Uh, they showed up inebriated. Uh, I cannot confirm or deny. Uh, that's what the story goes, but they already kind of tuned up and it, it, it carried on and, uh, she left and, um, the person running the, the event came out and said, Hey, we'd like to apologize to everybody. But, uh, uh, Tina was involved. Ike and Tina were involved in a car accident, and uh, Tina cannot dance. So we're going to refund everybody their money, and they all got up respectfully, and uh, they took the refund and they left. And it was, um, it wasn't a, uh, you know, a huge issue, and we're obviously not with the social media that we were back then. Right. We have now. Um, so you know, they went with it out of respect, and you know, now it, it's kind of funny if, if, if you saw a couple today that were in entertainment and sold out of the ballroom and, and you paid that money i mean would would they be given the same respect I, I i think not i think you'd have a lot of people standing there asking for an answer you know but uh it goes Helping. down in history and the stories are you know to be you know to be a fly on the wall while any of this was happening or anything through the rat pack era and you know you got dean and you got frankie and you got you know sammy walking around yeah asking about a hamburger or, you know, I think the funny joke was uh, they asked Frank about his favorite hamburger recipe. And he said, you know, get, uh, get a pound, a pound of hamburger, uh, a bottle of bourbon, some ice, and then call Dino and tell him to make burgers. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's <Classic>. great. <laughs> well, Ryan, uh, we really do appreciate you uh, coming to the show today. I hope this is uh, one of many visits. Uh, we have from you. Uh, I know we have a lot going on in your restaurant group, and uh, you're one busy chef, probably the busiest chef in Dallas right now. Well, very, very fortunate to be busy. Uh, obviously, I mean, you know, we've been working the whole time, and I cannot tell you that I wouldn't be able to be here if it wasn't for my team, everybody I work with, everybody I'm around, who I work for. I mean, it's it's honestly, um, I, it's very. I'm very, very fortunate. So, you know, I, I'll do the you know, cliche, you know, it's everybody, it's everybody else, not me. Um, right. but I'm, I'm very, very fortunate to have an arena to play in. Well, we appreciate you very much. And uh, we hope you're on real soon. Okay. Absolutely. Keep, you take, take care, care of your things, Jeff. Love you, buddy. Love you guys. All right. Talk to you, man. Peace. All right.